Hello. Right. So um, I would like to do two things today. I want to talk to you about the positivity problem. So I'm just uh, UN is a linear recurrent sequence uh, over the integers. And uh, so it's given to you. And so the positivity positivity problem says, uh, is it the case that uh, UN is uh, always non-negative? And the uh, ultimate positivity problem the ultimate positivity problem asks, um, is it the case that eventually uh, or ultimately um, UN is positive? So is there a T such that for all n greater or equal to t, uh, un is uh, always greater or equal to zero. And um, so what I'm going to show is that for, so I'm going to show, uh, hopefully I'll be able to show these two theorems. So the first one is that for simple uh, linear recurrent sequences of order at most nine, uh, positivity is decidable. And by simple, I mean um, the characteristic roots. So the roots of the characteristic polynomial are not repeated. So equivalently, if you think of it as a matrix, the matrix is diagonalizable. So that's that's um. A simpler case, and I'll just show you this. I mean, I'm trying to give you a little bit of a cross section of, of what goes on. Okay, so it's decidable. If you're interested in the the complexity, um, it's a little bit. Um, uh, okay, so the, the we we just have an upper bound. Uh, there are no lower bounds, but it's um, it's co n p to the p p to the p p to the p p, which is in p space. If you know what these things mean, then well, then you know what this means. If you don't, then just ignore it, just think p-space. But I mean, this is more like um, um, for anecdotal value because I'm just, I'm not going to, to sh yeah. <laughs> but it's probably a bit wasteful. You can probably do a bit better. <laughs> I mean, you, you, can, you can probably do pH to the PP to the PP. Um, so yeah, anyway, ignore that. Um, and um, the, the other uh, result I'm gonna show is that, again, for a simple linear recurrent sequences of uh, all or of any order, ultimate, I'm going to write like this, ultimate positivity is decidable. Okay, so that's maybe a bit surprising. You can only decide positivity up to order 9. Uh, but ultimate positivity, you can decide it for any order. Uh, the complexity uh, is actually a fixed parameter tractable. If the order is fixed, it's in polynomial time. If the order is not fixed, it's in P space. And it's actually hard for uh, the universal theory of the reals. So if you know what that is, that's the, the, the negation of the existential theory of the reals. If you know what that is, then you, you know something. So there's a, anyway, this is a complexity. But the interesting thing is that this is, uh, this is decidable. And you might think this is, um, a little bit of a contradiction because I'm saying that if I give you a linear recurrent sequence, I can decide whether or not ultimately it's non-negative regardless of the order. So you think, well, why can't I use this to decide positivity? And the reason is that even when I'm given a sequence that I know for a fact is ultimately positive, I don't actually know from when. This is a non-constructive sort of thing, right? So the non-constructiveness means that this, this is hard. And now, I don't know what happens at order 10. I will, I will just show you, uh, I'll try to show you what goes wrong at order 10. But at order 14, if you can solve positivity for simple linear recurrent sequences at order 14, as I explained yesterday, you can solve the Skolem problem for simple and non-simple linear recurrent sequences alike. So the only, the only remaining case, if you can solve positivity at order 14, you solve the Skolem problem at order 5. And that's been open for, for quite some time. Uh, so that's sort of the best hardness result I have. But at order 10, I don't know what happens. Okay, okay. so um, 
So that's that. So let me um, let me um, start. Uh, okay. So we're given we're given a linear recurrence sequence uh, un, as I said, uh, n equals one to infinity, and we know that because it's simple. Uh, okay. So it has characteristic roots. So the roots of the characteristic uh, polynomial. Okay, so the characteristic roots I'm going to write as um, row one dot 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 row L um, union. Just trying to have a notation. Okay, and um, union gamma one gamma one conjugate dot 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 gamma m gamma m conjugate. Okay, so what am I saying? These are characteristic roots that are real. So these are all algebraic numbers. These are the roots of the characteristic polynomial of the linear recurrence sequence. So equivalently, the eigenvalues of the corresponding matrix. These are real numbers, so real algebraic numbers. And these are all the ones that are not real. And of course, they always come in conjugate pairs because the characteristic polynomial is a polynomial with real coefficients. So if gamma is a root, then automatically gamma conjugate is a root. Okay? So this is well known. So they always come in conjugate pairs. And we know that you can write un as um, the summation for uh, i equals 1 to l of, uh, and I use ai, ai rho i to the uh, n plus the summation j equals 1 to m of cj uh, gamma j to the m, uh, to the n, sorry, uh, plus, plus cj conjugate gamma j conjugate to the n. Okay, it turns out that the, the polynomial has this particular form, the, the uh, sorry, the closed form solution, this is, all these things can be shown, of course, they, they um, yeah, they take them for granted. So the coefficients here, the cj's are algebraic numbers that can be explicitly computed. Yeah. Uh, that's the row. Row as in real, and these are the rows that are the real eigenvalue. The, uh, these, these are gamma. <laughs> these are gamma as in complex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, okay. Um, okay, does that make sense? So the, these are, this is why these ones are, are common conjugate. And the, uh, these coefficients are all real. So you can show that it has this general form. This is, this is sort of uh, um, not, not, it's a bit tedious, but you can show that in general it has this form. So these are normally the polynomials, but because the, se the sequence is simple, the polynomials all have degree zero, so they're all constant. Okay, so I'm trying to d decide um, positivity, so I'm trying to decide, um, uh, you know, whether for all n, un is greater or equal to zero. So I'm trying to decide this, and I have an expression for my un. And the high-level uh, strategy is um, first try to decide, in fact, what happens ultimately, right? Ultimately, you know, is this sequence actually always non-negative? If that's not the case, if ultimately the sequence is infinitely often negative, then certainly I've answered, I've answered that question. That qu the answer to that question is no. But if ultimately that sequence is non-negative, what I try to do for at order less than or equal to 9, I will put a bound and I say, okay, up to that bound, um, uh, uh, sorry, after that bound, I know that it's positive. And then I just need to check for the first uh, n steps. And this is a guess and check. This is why it's a co-np thing. So I try to guess, you know, where it might be negative and then I check it. And this is how I get this co-np to the pppppp and so on. Uh, Mikoi? No. You, you, okay, I thought you had that. Okay. So, um... And the, the AIs and the CJs come from the C, is those AI and CJ, alpha I, what are these? Yeah, so these, these AI, these AI are algebraic numbers, and you determine them by solving, um, so you know that, uh, if you don't know what they are, so leave them as unknowns, and you know what the first K terms of the linear recurrence sequence is, just solve, solve the, the, the equations, and you will find what these guys are. Um, but this guy depends on n, right? Depend on which element you're looking at. 
So, so the AI is constant for all n. The AI is a constant. Yeah. And the, and the CJ are constant. The CJ are constant. Yeah. Do you remember the general form? In general, you had uh, U n was equal to uh, summation for j equals one to you know it was k or something of p j of n times lambda j to the n, right? But because these roots are all simple, the degree, the degree of this is always one less than the multiplicity of the root. So if the roots are simple, the multiplicity is one. So the degree of these polynomials is all zero. So it means they're constants. So that's why they don't depend on n. And, and you can calculate all these. Do you remember I said algebraic numbers? You can calculate, treat them as rational numbers. So you just solve these linear equations and so on. So you, all this can be done effectively. In fact, in polynomial time. Uh, for fixed order in polynomial time, anyway. So, okay, so I have an expression of this form, and I'm just trying to determine, is it always non-negative, right? This is, this is what uh, the crux of, uh, of what goes on. Um, let's just try this. So, um, I will make one more, uh, one more assumption. <coughs> I will assume that, um, I will assume that, um, I will assume that no two, okay, uh, I'll just say it in words. When you look at these characteristic roots, the ratio of two characteristic roots is never a root of unity. So you never have uh, gamma i over gamma j. Uh, for, for i not equal to j, you have that gamma i over gamma j is not a root of unity. So that means, and the same for the rows, and the same for the rows and the gammas. Um, so that means that the, the, the word for this is the sequence is non-degenerate. The reason I can assume this is that if indeed this is a root of unity, I can look at subsequences of the original sequence, which are of smaller order, where I get rid of this, this problem. And I don't want to go into these details, but this is an assumption you can make. Uh, so this will, this will come later. Um, so it's called non-degeneracy. And, and um, this is a condition, by the way, that ensures the sequence has at most finitely many zeros. This gets rid of all the, um, the infinite arithmetic progression of zeros. Um, the, the, the whenever you've got infinite, an infinite set of zeros, that's because one of these ratios is a root of unity. So just take my word for it. Um, that's just something we'll use later. Just, you know, let's just assume that. Okay. Right. Okay. So... So what do we have? So um, what I want to do, if you look at this expression, what dominate? I want to know if this is greater, greater or equal to zero, right? So you need to look at the terms that dominate. It's like a polynomial. You look at the highest order term, right? So what will actually dominate? Well, what will dominate are the eigenvalues of largest modulus, OK? I need to look at the eigenvalues of largest modulus. So what I have is, um, suppose, let me just, uh, we'll just, we'll just suppose for a sec that the, the set of characteristic roots, I say eigenvalues, characteristic roots, of characteristic roots of largest modulus uh, does not include um, any row i. So they're all these complex, the, the, the non-real, the complex ones. So suppose, for instance, it's, uh, let's say, gamma 1, gamma 1 conjugate, gamma 2, gamma 2 conjugate, and gamma 3, gamma 3 conjugate. So suppose these guys are the ones of, of largest modulus, they have the same modulus, and all the other ones have strictly smaller, smaller modulus, right? Okay. So you can write, you, you'll, 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 you can write the un, as the summation for j equals 1 to 3 of cj gamma j gamma j uh, to the n uh, plus cj conjugate gamma j conjugate to the n plus some uh, r of n. And um, I'm going now to divide by the spectral radius, so by the modulus of the largest thing. So let's say that uh, R is the modulus of these, of these eigenvalues. They all have modulus R. This is a real number. So UN divided by 
r to the n is, uh, I'm going to put an r here, put an r, and, oh, shoot, uh, this is a capital R. Uh, well, this is an R prime now, okay. It's an R prime, but what do I know about R prime, R prime uh, of n? This tends to, this tends to zero, right? Because I'm dividing everything by R to the n, so this quantity, which had all eigenvalues of modulus strictly less than, than R, this, this tends to zero, right? Everybody happy with that? Okay, so if we look at this, um, this expression, we look at this expression, and we want to know, is this always, always non-negative, this whole expression? Now look at this expression and tell me whether this is always non-negative or not. So I guess we applied the lemma about epsilons and infinitely many, many... Very good. So remember this, this uh, Braverman lemma, we had this summation of alpha i, well, what was it, was it lambda? lambda? Lambda i to the n, and I said that uh, this is infinitely often less than epsilon, and infinitely often greater than epsilon. So this is infinitely often bounded below a wave, uh, bounded um, below zero, is often um, below minus epsilon, there's some, there's some epsilon. Remember this lemma that we proved? So basically this is infinitely often negative, but bounded away fr from zero, and this tends to zero. So the answer, the answer to the positivity and the ultimate positive question is therefore, therefore no. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so that's if the char the set of characters root of largest modulus does not include any uh, real number, then the answer to positivity and ultimate positivity is just no. So in order for um, this to have a chance to always be non-negative, there has to be uh, a real characteristic roots of maximum modulus. Everybody happy with that? Okay, so I'm just going to erase this. And I'm therefore going to write, um, I'm therefore, what notation do I have? Um, I'm going to write, uh, okay, so the maximum, the maximum uh, roots, the, the roots of maximum, the maximum modulus root, this uh, roots are, um, uh, uh, let's say, we're going to say that they're rho, that's the real one, and then we have gamma, gamma 1, gamma 1 conjugate, dot, 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 gamma, uh, we had gamma m, let's call it, um, uh, buh, buh, buh. okay, we'll just call them gamma m and gamma m conjugate because I'm, otherwise get scrim my notation. These are the ones of maximum modulus, and then there are some other ones of lower modulus. Now, if you're, if you're a, a, a real root of maximum modulus, then you're a real number, so we've got rho here. Uh, could we have another real one of maximum modulus? Minus rho, but we couldn't because, because the root, that's right, rho over minus rho is minus one, which is the root of unity, so we just have one. So now the expression looks like this, so un, is equal to uh, a rho plus um, the summation of j equals 1 to m of cj gamma j to the m plus cj conjugate gamma j conjugate to the m plus r of n, okay? And I'm going to divide this whole thing through by Oh yeah, that's an N here, thanks very much. And I'm going to let, I'm going to write lambda J be gamma J over rho. Okay, just as a new notation. And I'm going to divide through by rho to the N. Of course, rho is, um, we're assuming that rho is positive. Um, j just, just for the sake of argument, so I'm divide, or you could divide by the absolute value, it doesn't matter. Let's just assume rho is, is positive, it's obviously doesn't, if it were negative, this would just alternate the sign. The point is that uh, if rho is positive, then the positivity of un is the same as the positivity of un over rho to the n, okay? So if I want to know whether un is always non-negative, then I can ask this about this. 
So now, instead of rho to the n, I just have 1. And here, I change all my guys to lambda j. And that should be to the end. Thanks very much. Just checking if you guys are following. Now we've got R of n. And now this guy very helpfully tends to zero exponentially fast. And that will be important later that it's exponential. It's exponen exponentially fast because it's, com it's a sum of exponential terms of um, uh, modulus strictly less than, uh, than one. Okay? All right, okay. So I'm going, I'm interested in the positivity of, um, of this guy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define again this set L, which is the set of integers V1 up to Vm, Z to the M, such that Lambda 1 to the V1, lambda M to the V sub M is equal to 1. And so L is a Z module or free abelian group um, of rank uh, P. So rank P is just the cardinality of the basis. So i.e., there is a basis uh, L1. So that's a vector now. Uh, dot dot dot. LP. Okay. So L1 is a vector of m numbers. L2 is a vector of m numbers. LP is a vector of m numbers. I've got p of them. There's a basis that spans the entire uh, the entirety of L, um, and um, I will define uh, okay I will define the set T to be the set of Z the set of complex numbers Z1 up to Zm so these are each Zi Zj is in C Zj as uh, modulus 1, so this is the, the m torus in the complex plane. The set of, so t is a set of z1 to zm, uh, such that for each, for each j between 1 and p, um, for each j between 1 and p, z1 to the lj1 times dot 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 times Zm to the Ljm is equal to 1. Okay. So what have, what have I done? I'm looking at this, this m torus, but I'm, I'm, I want to take, take a quotient, or I want to take a subtorus of this, and so I'm imposing some additional constraints on algebraic constraints on those guys, and I want those guys to satisfy the same equation that those guys satisfy. So remember lambda 1? Lambda 1 to the V1 times lambda 2 to the V2 is lambda M to the Vm is equal to 1. I've got infinitely many of those, but this infinite set is actually spanned by some basis. Okay? And I insist that my Zm satisfy this basis. So certainly, every tuple of lambda 1 to lambda M actually lies in T. But there is a, a deep result in the Affentine approximation that is a, is a vast generalization of this result I showed on the first day, which is that the iterates on the circle of um, uh, a complex number of modulus 1 that's not a root of unity is dense on the circle. It's that the iterates of the lambda 1 to lambda m are a dense subset of t. So they're a subset of t, but they're actually dense. The closure, the topological closure of the iterates of the lambda m is equal to t. So I'm going to uh, write that. Uh, I'm going to write that in another board because I'm running out of space. Okay, so I'll leave this. I'll leave this here for now. E, uh, it's a topological closure, so I'm going to write it here. So, so, uh, so theorem. So this is um, uh, this is due to Kronecker, um, and it says the following. It says that 
take lambda 1 to the n, lambda m to the n, as n ranges over the natural. And if you take the, the closure, the topological closure, so let me just write it this way, is a dense subset of T. Okay, so the, the topological closure is equal to T. So it's definitely a subset of T. That's trivial to see because T satisfies, uh, it has all the uh, equations built in. But it, the, the fact that these guys are dense in, in, in T is, is actually, um, it's, 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 I mean, okay. It's a, it's a theorem due to uh, the Kronecker. Who was Polish, no doubt, no? <laughs> um, okay, so does that make sense? Okay, it's just a little bit of, so the idea is that I've, I've, uh, these lambda one, I'm looking, I'm interested, I'm trying to give an intuition. I'm interested in the orbit, I take this lambda one to lambda m. They live in, in, in C to the m, right? They live in this, in the complex, uh, they're, they're actually all of modulus one, so they live on the m dimensional complex torus. They're not dense on the torus unless L has rank zero, okay? Unless the, 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 um, the, 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 unless this L here has rank zero. Um, and what I'm interested in is to compute the subtorus. It's always going to be a subtorus, a topological subtorus, such that the iterates of these lambda 1, lambda m are actually dense in. And, and this is what I've done with this, this set T. Now, this set T is actually a nice set. I mean, this is, this is a set that, um, uh, it's a continuous set, and it's a set that I can manipulate in the existential theory of the reals, if you know what that is. But we'll come back to this. I mean, but from the point of view of um, um, computational algebraic geometry, uh, this set T is something I can, I can ask questions about this set T, and, and I can, uh, we'll, we'll come to that a bit later. Okay. Um, right. So I've covered all this. Um... Right, okay, so I'm, I want to come back to my function un. So I have uh, un over rho to the n, it's a plus, so I have the expression, uh, the expression there, right? And I want to write this as h of lambda 1 to the n, dot, 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 lambda m to the n plus r of n. Now, notice that un actually depends not just on the lambda, but on the, la the, on the lambda j, but on the lambda j conjugate. But actually, the lambda j conjugate are, of course, determined by the lambda j, by, by being their conjugates. So I can just pick out m of them and say that un over rho to the n just depends on, on m of those guys, not, not the 2m that are actually up there, plus this thing that decays exponentially fast. Right? Does it make sense? Okay, so I can, I, can, I can say that. Now, h is actually a linear function, right? H, well, it's almost a linear function. It's a funny sort of function because it does Cj times something plus Cj conjugate times the conjugate of the, the something. So it's a quasi-linear function. Think of it as a linear function uh, uh, if you want. It, it's a simple function, certainly, is what I'm trying to say. And now what I, um, I'm interested in whether this is greater or equal to zero. Okay. So... If I look at my t, I'm just going to draw my t here. So let's say that my t is this torus, okay? I'm just, just representing. t is a topological torus, right? Uh, so let's just say it looks something like this. And I want to evaluate, uh, I want to look at h evaluated at, uh, at, at, um, at these, these various points. So one thing that would be very relevant is to know h evaluated on the torus. Okay, so I want to think of H as a function now from the torus into the reals. H is a function into the reals because it's self-conjugate, so it always gives a real number. And therefore, I can compute the minimum of H, so I, I'm interested in what is the minimum of H restricted to the torus, or H on the, on the torus, that's a real number. And I say minimum because this is going to be a compact set, because it's closed and bounded. Okay, so I can compute the minimum. And what I, wh what I claim is that this is something that I can compute. Um, and to see this, if you know about Tarski, uh, Tarski's theorem, about the decidability of the 
uh, first order theory of the reals. In fact, in the existential first order theory of the reals, you can phrase this question, um, you know, what is the minimum? You can, you can actually get your hand on the corresponding algebraic. I mean, th these are always going to be algebraic numbers and you can compute them. Uh, well, it's kind of funny because um, because um, H H actually well, in order to view it as over the reals, you need to decompose treat each of these Z ones as uh, a plus b i, where a square plus b square. So now a and b are real. So you double the dimension. You're working in R to the m squared instead of c to the m, and you say a square plus b square equals one. And now, in, and then you just need to make sure you enforce the fact that you treat this as the real part and the complex part. And yeah, and, and then yes, it becomes a polynomial over the reals, indeed. Okay, okay, so just trust me that this can be computed. Can be computed. Okay, the minimum uh, this. And I'm interested in a set of points. So I'm interested in, a, what do I, do I call it something? I'm interested in the, uh, uh, I want a good notation for this. Maybe Z. Z. So the set of uh, the set of Z one dot dot in Z m in T such that H of Z one Z m is equal to the minimum of H restricted to T. I, I call the Z as the the zero set, or some maybe it's not such a good uh, terminology. Anyway. The, 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 the set of points on T where H achieves its minimum. Okay? So does this make sense? Are you guys with me? Now, what I want to... Um, what I want to... So suppose I, I have this. Actually, let's look at something. Let's look at just, uh, just something. There, there are three situations. So suppose... First possibility. So suppose... Uh, so, so the fir first thing is that the minimum, the minimum of H restricted to T is strictly less than zero. Then what happens in terms of answering this question, right? I'm, I'm always, remember in the back of my mind, I want to know, is it the case that this thing is always greater or equal to zero? Suppose the minimum of H restricted to T is strictly negative. What can I say? Do, you, do we know anything about A, about the sign of A? Is it A mean like Ah, okay. Uh, I meant, uh, that's a very good point. So I'm going to say <laughs> plus A less than zero. Thank you. Yeah. So le let me write it as um, A plus. Yeah, thanks very much. Yes, very good point. Okay, suppose this happens. Then so somebody, <laughs> somebody else. What, what, what can I say? I can answer my question. Yeah, David? You're not ultimately positive. Why is that? Because you approach arbitrarily close to the minimum point, so... Yes. And the function is continuous. And I know that this guy eventually uh, becomes uh, very, very small, but I'm strictly less than zero, so at some point... Okay, I'm done. So I can answer, and the answer is, in that case, not, uh, not ultimately positive. Okay? And therefore not positive. Okay, suppose that A plus this minimum is strictly greater than zero, then somebody else, what happens? Someone, yeah, go ahead. It's not quite yes. So uh, you have to wait until this uh, uh, residue is uh, yes. smaller than... Exactly. You've got to wait a little bit to make sure this guy can't bother you anymore. And after a while, you know that you're bounded away from zero, and then you're good. And you can compute explicit bounds on this, because you have bounds on the modulus of all these things. Remember, algebraic numbers, I can compute whatever I want. I can compute bounds and so on, and, and so okay. So basically, the answer is, um, yes, modulo, I need to, I have a threshold, certainly. So certainly, I know that I'm ultimately positive. Okay, I know I'm ultimately really positive, and with with the threshold. Okay, so the critical case is obviously a plus this minimum uh, is equal to zero, right? I mean, I need to. That's that's going to be hard. So what do I do in that case? Uh, well, 
let's make another assumption here. Let's suppose that Z is a finite set. So let's suppose it's uh, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, but it's finite. Okay? So, I just an assumption, we'll, we'll come back to it later. So suppose that you've got, you know, uh, alpha 1, maybe alpha 2, maybe alpha 3, and this is where H ach achieves its minimum, and everywhere else H is, uh, H is above, uh, you know, uh, well, it's not a minimum. Okay. Uh, okay. So in that case, uh, in that case, what can I do? Yeah, okay, I'm going to just get in real estate at some point. It's that. So in that case, what can I do? Uh, then in that case, I'm a little bit, it's not obvious what to do. And we just uh, test around those values, uh, check that it's what happens in the, in the small radius. Well, you can go in a small radius, but um, then you're fighting against R, right? Because you don't know how close, these lambda to the n, they approach, they're dense, so they will approach. So let's just draw the picture again. We've got this thing, okay, and we've got this alpha 1 here. And we know that the lambda 1, alpha 1, by the way, sorry, it's a, it's a vector, right? It's a, it's a vector because it lives on my torus. We know that lambda 1 dot dot, dot lambda m, uh, we know that these guys, sorry, we know that these guys, they are, they are dense on this torus. So, you know, eventually they, infinitely often they approach alpha 1 closer and closer. But we don't really have a sense of, you know, how close they are and so, what, you know, when do they approach. And the R, the R of n, you know, decays, but the, you know, if the lambda 1 to the n get really, really close, you know, at some point you come around and you're incredibly close to alpha 1, or for that matter you hit it, then, um, you know, uh, you don't really know what, you know, what's happening. So, a couple observations. First of all, let's write uh, alpha 1 as, um, uh, let's say, it's a vector. So let's say it's uh, beta 1, dot, 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 beta m. And um, the first observation is lambda 1 to the m. Um, lambda 1 to the m. Can I actually hit, can I actually hit this point? Can my iterates actually hit it? So can I have, in particular, the first coordinate of my iterates lambda hit the first coordinate of my alpha 1? Lambda 1 to the m equals uh, beta, not to the m, to the k, for some k, or to the n. Can I actually hit, hit this point? Nothing prevents it, right? I could hit it. I could be unlucky. Can I hit it twice? No? Why is that? That's right. If I hit it twice, this means lambda 1 has to be a root of unity. So I can hit it at most once, and moreover, I can decide whether or not I hit it, and if I, um, I can place bounds, and I say from this bound on, you never hit it anymore. So I can pretend that this never happens. Okay. So let's look again at this picture. Okay, so here's my... Here's my... Here's my beta 1. Here's my beta 1. Here's my, uh, here's my lambda 1. And lambda 1 to the n is dense on the circle, and, you know, eventually I get close, close to this. So let's say this angle is uh, theta. Let's say this angle here is psi. And so lambda 1 to the n is going to be e to the i and theta. And I want to know... How far can lambda 1 to the n get to beta 1? So I want to know how far, how far can I get. Okay. Now, if I magnify, I'm interested in the straight distance, but I can approximate the straight distance with the arc. Okay. So basically, what I'm interested in is uh, n theta minus 2, I don't know, 2j pi. Okay, minus psi, and I want to know, uh, I want a lower bound on this. 
Okay? So what I'm saying is that n theta, this is e to the i n theta, right? Now, how close is this to psi? Well, n theta is going to get really large, so I need to subtract uh, uh, multiples of 2 pi. So this is why I'm writing n theta minus 2j pi. I don't know what j is, but n theta minus 2j pi tells me what is this angle here. That's my n theta minus 2j pi. And I want to know what's the difference between this angle and this angle psi, right? So between this angle and this psi, so that tells me what is this angle here, and that's a good approximation of the straight line distance. And here's where you need to use Baker's theorem. So I'm not going to state Baker's theorem. It's, it takes a little bit, um, it's a bit long to state. So it's this very deep theorem that, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, um, earned Baker the Fields Medal. And it's, it tells you, it gives you a lower bound on these things which are called linear forms and logarithms. Why are they logarithms? Well, these are logarithms of algebraic numbers. Theta is a log of an algebraic number because of this. Well, it's a log, it's a, it, it, it's a log of, sorry, it's lambda 1, which is e to the i theta. So i theta is the log of lambda 1, or there, there is a branch where i theta is a, 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 a an analytic branch of log, where i theta is a, so, but factor out the i. So theta is the log of an algebraic number. Pi is the log of an algebraic number. It's log of minus 1. And psi is the log of an algebraic number. So I have a linear form in logarithms. And Baker's theorem tells you you have to work all these things out. But there's a polynomial of degree, it's going to be in the hundreds or something. It's going to be high degree polynomial. It's a polynomial such that this is bigger than 1 over p, to p of n as long as this quantity is not zero. If this quantity is not zero, then it's bounded below by one over a uh, polynomial. But I, I know that I can ensure this quantity is not zero. Okay? So that's by, that's by uh, Baker's, Baker's theorem. Okay, so we're almost there. We know that, we know that the, the iterates of the lambda ones they don't approach this point too quickly. They're always bounded away by an inverse polynomial. Now, uh, you need to look, we're interested in the quantity a plus h of lambda one dot 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 lambda, sorry, lambda one to the n lambda, what is it, lambda uh, uh, m to the n, okay. I know that this is bounded away. This is bounded away from alpha 1. And likewise, the other ones are bounded away by, I don't even have to worry about this. This is bounded away from alpha 1 by a polynomial bound. And h is a function that behaves reasonably. In fact, h is a function that can be expressed in the existential theory of the real. So it's always uh, dominated by a polynomial. So there, there are some general results uh, from real algebraic geometry. So basically, what I'm saying is that there's a polynomial p prime such that this is always bounded below by Sorry, this in absolute value, uh, so this h minus the minimum of h restricted to t is always bounded below by 1 over, let me call it q of n. So there's a polynomial q. It depends on p. It's not p, obviously, but it depends on, it depends on p because it has to do with h. But there is a polynomial q such that this quantity is bounded below by 1 over q of n, okay? So this, this is some, this is some uh, um, you can do this with some uh, real algebraic geometry. And so we're almost there because if we come back here, we were in case 3. We were in case 3 where... This quantity is equal to zero. Well, we know that this is bounded away from zero by some one over q of n. Okay. Um, well, then we're we're basically done because this decays exponentially fast, and this decays polynomially fast. So the answer is it's ultimately positive, and um, the nice thing is uh, we can place some, uh, uh, we can, this is all constructive, so you can place bounds and so on. Okay, so, so, you, so you not only decide ultimate positivity, you're able to decide positivity. Okay, does this make sense? I did not use the nine, but I did not even finish this proof. 
I need to use a 9 to finish the proof. This proof is not complete. What's missing? Special case that is finite in Yeah, we're here, right? Okay, so um, this assumption is in general is not going to be true. You can explicitly construct. So this is true provided that uh, oh shit, I deleted it. Uh, okay. Do you remember I had the rank, the rank of L, and I deleted that? I managed to delete that. I meant to leave it there. Yeah, it's P, but where do I have it? I have it written somewhere? Sorry? It was left and I erased it. Okay. True provided the rank of L, which was P, uh, is equal either to 0 to 1 to m minus 1 or to m. So if the rank of L is either 0 or it's 1 or it's, m, it's, 1 or it's m, then the set will be finite. This is a very technical result. So this is something we, we, we show. I mean, this is like, this gets um, very technical. Uh, but it's, it's true. And it's actually, um, it, it, you know, when these, this assumption is in hold, you can construct counterexamples. So where does the 9 come in? Well, um, so if you have, um, if you have, if you've got order 9, the possibility, so now we have LRF of order 9. So the possibilities are the following. You could have uh, UN is equal to, sorry, UN over rho to the N is equal to A plus H of lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4. So this is order 9, because each of these guys has a conjugate, so that's 8 plus, one, plus the, the, the real is, is 9. And that's OK, because here, there is no pesky real term. So you just have to look at the minimum of h on the torus. If the minimum is 0, then this is always bigger or equal to 0. You're done. If the minimum is less than 0, you're, you're screwed. And minimum bigger than 0, you're also done. So that case is OK. But the other possibility at order 9 would be the following. A, need a bit more space. So I could also have, the picture is this. I could also have uh, so a real eigenvalue of modulus 1, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, then the conjugates, lambda 1 conjugate, lambda 2 conjugate, lambda 3 conjugate, and a smaller one, uh, R. This is my R of n. And so this is of the form h plus h of lambda 1 to the n, lambda 2 to the n, lambda 3 three to the n plus r of n. And now here m equals three. So what could the rank be? Well, the rank could be either zero or one or m minus one, which is three minus one, which is two, or m, which is three. So all these cases are okay in the case of nine. You know, the rank, I said it's, I have a finite set provided, oh, did I erase this? Oh no, provided the rank is zero, one, m minus one or m. But here, m is 3, so 0, 1, 2, or 3, and that covers all the possibilities, right? Okay, this is why I can do it. What's the hard case at 10, by the way? Uh, well, the hard case at 10 is when you have this, and you have lambda 4, lambda 4 conjugate, so you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That we don't know how to do, because that corresponds to this case, where you have plus an r of n, and when the rank... The rank is equal to 2, m is equal to 4. You could have, in terms of the zeros, um, when you look at the, 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 the torus, this is your t. You could have the set of 0, and for, I'm going to use the blue chalk since it's here. The set of 0 could actually, it's a variety, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a set of zeros, of a, but it could actually be a, a curve, okay? So in that case, uh, Baker's theorem will not help you. We don't know how to, how to get a constructive. Sorry? When you were sleeping. <laughs> Where did I get it? Sorry, I erased, uh, I, I used it here. Uh, so 
I used it when I was uh, computing the sum of n theta minus 2 pi j minus psi, and I was placing a polynomial, an inverse polynomial lower bound on how small this quantity can be. And this inverse a polynomial lower bound was uh, ultimately always wins against an exponentially decaying terms R. So this is how I win. Okay, does this make sense? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, sure. So um, what Caleb is asking is, uh, how do I decide this? Well, again, I look at the minimum of H on, on the torus T. If this is strictly less than zero, then I'm screwed. If this is strictly bigger than zero, I win. And if this is equal to zero, then this is always big or equal to zero. Sorry. This, this, yeah, I look at uh, A plus, sorry. I'm, I'm talking about, I look at whether this is, how does this compare to zero? Sorry, A plus this minimum. If, if this is greater than zero, then I win. If this is less than zero, then I lose. If it's actually equal to zero, I win because I don't have a pesky R of N to, that could shoot me over, just tip me over just about, it, it doesn't exist. So this is why luckily order nine, I can just about do it. Uh, other questions? So let me just try because I can do now, how do I do ultimate positivity, right? I've done positivity and constructively ultimate positivity up to order nine, but I claimed I can do ultimate positivity up to arbitrary large orders. Yeah? Could you just explain how you, you use the assumption that the rank is zero, one, or m minus one, or m? So you conclude that in some cases you can get a curve? Yes. And in, some, uh, in the bad cases you can get yes. a curve. But wh where did you actually show that you cannot get a curve? Ah, okay. So. At order nine, I either have this case or I have that case, okay? Or, or I have cases that are even easier. This case, I've just, I've just said we're happy. This is the critical case, right? So here, that's my M, okay? So what could the rank be? Well, the rank could be zero, one, two, or three. Sorry? Why is what? Ah, well, the rank is, uh, the rank is computed, um, this thing lives in C to the M. So the rank of the, the, the lattice is at most three because the dimension is at most three. Okay, so for sure the rank is at most three. Uh, and the rank is an integer. Uh, so it's zero, one, two, or three. Okay, okay. Well, if it's zero, then I'm good because I said if it's zero, zero one, I'm good. And two hap happens to be M minus one, so I'm good. Because of this theorem. This theorem says if the rank is m minus one, then it's finite. I mean, this, this is a non I mean, this is the one of the, uh, I mean, this is very technical, but it's, I mean, you just have to take it as a black box. Uh, and, it, and again, if the rank is three, then it's equal to m, so it's okay. And the hard case comes at order uh, 10, because at order 10, I can have my m equals four and the rank equals two. And when the rank is two, it's not of the form zero, one, m, or m minus one. It's, it's the first case we don't know how to handle. And you can construct, it's not just, oh, we don't know how to handle, maybe it's true. You can, you can, you can construct examples where you have an infinite set of zeros. And do, in this, those examples, do you have, uh, uh, well, this, do you know if um, this is also a counterexample to a generalization of Baker's theorem for approximating, uh, approaching curves? No, that would be fantastic. No, Baker's theorem is wasteful, but improving Baker's theorem is, uh, I mean, an incredibly hard area of analytic number theory, and there's a whole industry of people. And I corresponded with the guy who's a world expert, this guy, Mat Matvev, or Matvev, in, this Russian guy, uh, about the, the sort of the best known possible bounds. <coughs> but they are non-constructive improvement to Baker's theorem. And um, I guess I have another, yeah, yeah, half an hour. So let me show you, so, there, so Baker's theorem is completely constructive. Baker's theorem tells you, well, it, constructive in the sense, if it's not zero, it's bounded, there, there are no exceptions. There are some results that give uh, better bounds than Baker's theorem, but they only hold uh, in the limit. They only hold for n sufficiently large. And I'm going to show how this then allows you to do ultimate positivity, but in a non-constructive way. 
So, okay, any, any, before I do this, any other questions? I think this is, uh, you know, might as well make sure everybody's happy with this proof. Other questions about this one? Yeah? I'm wondering if there's specific order 10 uh, LRSs that, are, that you fit. Specific ones that you don't. You don't know? Uh, no, because I don't actually, it's a good question. At some point I ask one of my graduate students to say, oh, could you generate, you know, and it becomes very hard to experiment with these things because you want to generate some LRS that for which positivity is hard to decide, right? So it has to have all these things like the, you know, uh, Mars and Venus and everything has to be aligned. If you take a random, if you pluck a random LRS out of thin air, the probability that this happens is zero. You know, with probability one, if you take a random matrix, it will have either a strictly dominant real eigenvalue or a pair of strictly dominant conjugate eigenvalues, in which case it's decidable. So you have to be lucky. So if you're experimenting, if you're trying to do this numerically, it's a very sparse, uh, space that you're investigating. It's a ten-dimensional space, so it becomes uh, it becomes very tricky. So we haven't we didn't get very far on that, but yeah, but it's but actually we don't know. Yeah. I mean, can you not build the matrix by hand? Have the eigenvalues you want. Uh, there is this inverse eigenvalue uh, problem, but then you have these matrices that have algebraic numbers as entries, not not uh, sort of they're you know they're not over the integers. I mean, this is no. Th this actually everything I've said. If you replace integers by algebraic numbers, apart from the exponent, but you know, if your LRS is over algebraic numbers, so everything holds the same. Uh, it's nothing to do with the fact that I'm, I've got a LRS over Z. I could have an LRS over real algebraic numbers. But in terms of constructing something where you can really see and, and play with and so on, it's, it's difficult. But yeah, it's a good, I mean, yeah, this is a good question. It's the fact that we don't know how to do it doesn't mean um, that, yeah, that there are. Uh. Any other question? Okay, so to do the ultimate positivity from here is a very small step. But I need to use something else than Baker's theorem. I need a Baker theorem for curves. Baker's theorem bounded me away, bounded my iterates away from single points. Okay, so from when the variety was zero dimensional, as it were. When the variety is one dimensional or two dimensional, so on, I, I, I need something else. And it turns out that they, they have these, um, they have these, uh, these bounds. In fact, they, they Maybe I just about have time to show you this. Um, I'll ju okay, I'll just tell you the history of, 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 of this thing and just not ma make sure I don't make a mistake. Um, maybe I'll do, okay, I'll do this after just in case I have time. The, 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 um, so the, the, these, are, um, these are results that come from lower, uh, just gonna say some words and then I'll explain what these things are. Lower bound on some of S units, which come from the celebrated uh, result, uh, which is called um, uh, the, the Schmidt uh, subspace theorem. And then there's a piadic version of the Schmidt subspace theorem, which was established by a PhD student of Wolfgang Schmidt, this guy by the name of uh, Schlickewey. And these were developed over a series of years. And these results are very powerful generalization of Roth theorem. And Roth theorem was already very hard because it earned Roth the, the, uh, the, the Fields Medal in, in 1958. Just tell you what Roth theorem says. Um, do you remember that take alpha to be take alpha to be a real algebraic um, a real algebraic number, say, and you're looking at alpha minus p over q, and Dirac Clay said that you can always approximate alpha using rational numbers in such a way that the approximation is pretty good. There are infinitely many p's and q's such that alpha minus p over q is within one over q squared. So if you use large integers, you want your approximation to be very good. There are infinitely many of those. And then the question is, can you improve this too? So this is improving this one, getting this one lower, that's a Lagrange constant, and there's a, an entire, uh, I mean, this is a whole area. And then there's improving the exponent, this is called the irrationality measure of the algebraic number. So what if you improve it by epsilon? And Roth theorem, and this was a combination of long line of works in the, um, in the 20th century, which called me to Roth theorem, says that uh, for all epsilon greater than zero, the set of p, the set of p and q, such that this that achieves this is finite. Okay, so you only have finitely many solutions. After a while, you cannot do this for any epsilon. But the thing about Roth theorem is that it's non-constructive, and to this day, this is non-constructive. I give you alpha, you know, say cube root of seven or something, 
I give you epsilon, which is, let's say, 1 over 100, a small epsilon. Uh, and so you know this set is finite by Roth theorem, but nobody can actually exhibit this set. This is a, 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 it's a highly non-constructive proof. And the, the, the subspace theorem sort of, and the Piatic subspace theorem vastly generalize this. And this is what we use in order to, uh, to obtain, uh, to solve ultimate positivity. And I'm just going to, I'm going to try to explain to you the, the, the fundamental result. This is on lower bounds on some of S units, just using an example. So suppose you, suppose you look at, suppose you look at the quantity, let's say, 7 to the x minus, I don't know, 13 to the y. Okay, you look at this. And you let x and y range over natural numbers. And you say, how small can this get? Okay, in absolute value. Uh, and how small can this get, say, infinitely often? So, you know, can you infinitely often, as x and y range over the integers, can you infinitely often get below, let's say, 10? Or can you infinitely often get below square root of the biggest one of the two? Or, you know, things like that. I mean, these are, these are kind of very natural questions. And it turns out this is a very deep result. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. I should say what the result is. So for all epsilon greater than zero, um, there exists T such that uh, for, all, for all X and Y above T, so T is a threshold. So given epsilon, there exists a threshold such that if X and Y are sufficiently large, then 7 to the x minus 13 to the y is bigger than the maximum of the 2 to the 1 minus epsilon. So where m is the maximum of 7 to the x and 13 to the y. So this is an absolutely remarkable result because it tells you that if x and y are large enough, this quantity is dominated by the largest one. Okay, it's ultimately dominated by the largest one. Okay, Multipl multiplicatively speaking. So in particular, you're only finitely often less than the square root of the largest of the two because for square root, this would correspond to epsilon equals a half. If you stick here, no, no. It, uh, it's not specific. You can apply it to, you can, instead of 7 and 13, the reason I use 7 and 13 is because of a technical result. This thing is true as long as this is not zero. But by using prime numbers, I know it's not zero, so I'm just trying to... No, you can replace this by uh, a linear combination of algebraic integers, even if they're not real. So, they're so this is... Um, yes, and this is what we'll do in, in a second. Now, you can actually prove this constructively using Baker's theorem, as it were. I, I, I know how to do this, but suppose I ask to answer Moshe, I add, I add another... I'm going to add a prime number just to, again, for this business of the... Um, actually, I'm going to put a two here, then I know... I know that this, can, um, this is going to be true. Uh, okay, it doesn't matter, sorry. Uh, uh, the point is, uh, there are little caveats. No pr s proper subsum must be zero, okay? So you need to check these, these things. So just ignore that for a second. Uh, the same is true. And now I replace, so let me just put plus or minus, plus or minus, plus or minus. And I look at this expression. So plus or minus 7 to the x, 13 to the y, 19 to the z. Then this is always... Um, bigger than the maximum to the 1 minus epsilon for sufficiently large x, y, and z. So where m is the maximum between. Okay, so this is a very deep result. This is non-constructive, so you cannot... If I give you the epsilon, you know that there's a threshold, but we don't know how to compute this threshold. But how does this apply? Well, this applies, uh, this applies to the problem at hand because... Um, let me look at it again. When you... When you have this, um, this uh, uh, un equals, uh, you know, let's say we say the summation, and I'm just going to write it like this now, i equals 1 to n of a i lambda i to the n plus r of n. So here I've got the eigenvalues of maximum modulus. Now, what I know is that this guy in absolute value, so... For any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a threshold t such that for all n greater or equal to t, 
what is this? This is a1 lambda 1 to the n plus a dot plus a, uh, a k lambda k to the n is bigger than the largest one of these guys, but they all have the same modulus. They all, they're, all, they're all of maximum modulus, so I'm going to just put lambda 1 to the uh, n 1 minus epsilon. Okay? You, you get something like this, provided no proper subsum is zero and so on. The reason you know no proper subsum is zero, by the way, is because of scholar maler lec theorem. The scholar maler lec theorem tells you any one of these proper subsums is actually a linear recurrent sequence, and scholar maler lec tells you only has finitely many zeros because we assume non degeneracy. So there are a few things and, and so on you have to do, but let's just ignore that. So you know you're bigger than this. Well, then you win because this is going to be bigger than your R of n. Than your R of n. Why? Because R decays exponentially, um, but the largest eigenvalue in there has modulus strictly smaller than lambda 1. So you just need to, so let me just rewrite this lambda 1 to the 1 minus epsilon to the n. So I just need to make sure that lambda 1 to the 1 minus epsilon, or lambda 1 absolute value is bigger than the uh, largest eigenvalue that appears in this sum. And so I know that this will dominate that. And so ultimately, uh, ultimately, I'm, I'm home free. Okay, I don't know. Maybe I went a bit too, too fast. I see some puzzled looks. Okay. Th so, so yeah. L l let me let me not belabor belabor this 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 point. Uh, morally speaking, what we're doing here is that we have a non-constructive strengthening of Baker's theorem that works now for curves. For, that works for arbitrary varieties, in fact. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it improves non-constructively. So, uh, yes, yes. Only when I have two terms. If you've got more than two terms, I know how to do it. But for two terms, I I know. Ultimate positivity is decidable. Uh, yeah, so how do I decide ultimate positivity? Okay, so, so that, that's good. So what I do is I look at this, I look at this expression again, and I look at the minimum of, I look at uh, A plus the minimum of H restricted to T. If that's less than zero, I know that I'm not ultimately positive. If that's above zero, I know that I'm ultimately positive. And that if it's equal to zero, then I know that I'm ultimately positive. Because eventually this term is dominated by that. And because the minimum of this expression is above zero, uh, this guy is not going to bring it below zero because this, this guy is going to be less than lambda 1 to the n 1 minus epsilon for n large enough, ultimately. But I don't have a threshold for when this happens. I can only say, well, ultimately, ultimately, this guy wins. This guy becomes irrelevant. So I'm only deciding ultimate positivity. But now, I, I, my order, I, I can do this for any order I want. So it's an improvement of Baker because um, it, it applies more widely. The bound is not as strong. Baker gives me a polynomial, an inverse polynomial bound. This gives me, um, it gives me an exponential bound, but the exponential can be as good as I want because I can pick my epsilon. Um, yeah, so it's a trade-off. And it's not constructive. That's the biggest thing. It's not constructive. As soon as you have a constructive version of this, then you can decide positivity for linear recurrent sequences for arbitrary. Then you can decide Skolem for order five. But you can prove Roth theorem also for, you know, which, uh, constructively, uh, which, is, uh, which would be a much bigger thing than, than all of these things, right? This is, uh, I mean, constructive version of Roth theorem is a problem that's been open since, uh, you know, 1958, basically. Uh, okay, does that, that make sense? Yeah? So the two theorems you proved today, yeah. they assume uh, simple roots of the characters. Yes. What, what happens in general? So in general, you can decide positivity and ultimate positivity up to order five. And at order six, you have these very strong hardness results. Both, yeah. Not exactly the same, but very related ones, yes. At order six, yeah. So to do with the Iris Roth theorem, to do with... Um, ah. So, uh, Roth theorem talks about the exponent, but you can also talk about the constant here, that's the Lagrange constant. And people have no idea how to 
estimate this constant for numbers like pi and so on. Even there's not a single algebraic number of degree three or above for which we know what this, you know, the best part, the nth of the set of C's that you can reduce when, when you've got two here. And, you, and if you could decide ultimate positivity or positivity for order six, you could start computing these constants arbitrarily closely. So th this is the hardness result. Um, actually, this is related to something else. Um, so th there's, um, there's this uh, Hartmannus uh, Stearns conjecture. Who knows? Who, who's, uh, you, Moshe, you must know this, Hartmannus Stearns. Uh, any, anybody are Hartmannus Stearns? So, but, so Hartmannus is, is, I mean, both Hartmannus and Stearns are well-known computer scientists. So they, they formulated this conjecture in the 50s. So the Hartmannus Stearns conjecture is a conjecture trying to show superlinear lower bounds for uh, multiplication. So you know there was this whole thing, you know, Kolmogorov thought multiplication could not be done better than quadratic. And then uh, Kar Karatsuba, what's his name, um, improved, you know, he, he showed, oh, you can actually do a bit better. And you know, now the best bounds are, are these bounds using the discrete Fourier transform where you get these um, n times log star of n, right? I mean, these crazy n log n log star of n. Uh, okay, so this is the complexity of, of multiplication. But so it's all, all the results we have are supralinear and the complexity. And the Hartmann and Stern's conjecture is a conjecture aiming to show a lower bound of supralinear. And what does this conjecture uh, say? It says the following, you take a Turing machine that just generates, um, that has, um, it just generates uh, uh, bits, zeros and ones, okay? And you read these bits, it's an infinite stream of bits, and you read these bits as the, the, the decimal digits of, uh, you know, some, so there, there's an infinite stream that the Turing machine generates, and you read them, you evaluate them as a, as a number. So it defines a real number. The Hart minus Stern's conjecture is that this number is always either rational or transcendental. It can never be algebraic. Now, it sounds crazy, but it's clear that a rational number you can generate because that's just gonna be periodic. So in fact, the finite automaton can generate this. And it's not hard to see that you can generate transcendental numbers. If I had a bit more time, I could actually uh, prove it to you. Well, okay, this would require maybe, maybe a couple of hours and I could show you, you can definitely generate, I can prove to you, here's a number and it's transcendental. Nothing, nothing. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The machine is a real time Turing machine, meaning that, yeah, sorry, thanks, uh, uh, Shimon. Um, it needs to output, uh, it, there's, a, there's a K, and it needs to output a new bit every K steps. So it cannot compute for more than K, yeah, yeah, sorry, of course, of course. Uh, it cannot compute for more than K steps, so it, 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 every K steps it must output a number. And you can generate transcendental numbers, the, the so-called Uville numbers, um, okay, but it's believed that you cannot generate uh, algebraic numbers. And if that's true, then multiplication is super polynomial time, is super linear. And why is that? Well, basically because, um, basically for the following reason, if multiplication were linear time, I'm not gonna write it, suppose multiplication were linear time. Tomorrow somebody comes, you know, Mikoi comes, I've got a linear time algorithm to multiply two, two numbers, right? So I give you two n-bit numbers and I compute uh, a times b, in time that's linear in n, honest to God linear in n, in the bit model of complexity, okay? Then you can start applying Newton's method to compute square root of two. And if you compute square root of two using Newton's method, you double the number of bits at each iteration, okay? And what does Newton's method involve? It involves additions, subtractions, and multiplications, and that's it. You're just computing, uh, doing these things. And all these operations, obviously addition and subtraction are linear time. The only thing that's not clear to be linear time is uh, multiplication, but now MikoI has provided an algorithm. So you can output the digits of square root two using a Turing machine, uh, in a, using a real-time Turing machine. You output the next bit of square root two every k steps. So this violates the hartmann Stern's conjecture, and, um, and, uh, uh, and therefore, okay, therefore that, you know, if the conjecture is true, then you cannot multiply in, in real time. Now, number theorists are interested in this conjecture, and there's a number theorist uh, uh, in York, um, Evgeny uh, Zorin, um, who came to Oxford once to give a talk on the hartmann Stern's conjecture. So they were attacking this uh, uh, hartmann Stern's conjecture using uh, this thing called Mahler's method and are trying to prove it for weaker models than real-time Turing machines. So, you know, uh, you know, automata, push down automata, you know, kind of models are a bit weaker and they're trying to show special cases and so on, but using number theoretic tools. And so, um, so I was, you know, I, I went to the, to the talk, um, so did uh, uh, Ben Worrell and uh, 
Uh, you know, and alongside this was the number theory seminar in Oxford. So Andrew Wiles was there. Uh, Birch of the Birch uh, Swinnerton and Dyer um, conjecture was there. Uh, Roger Heath Brown, who's this very famous antic number theorist, was there. I mean, they, they had, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, Wilkie was there. Alex Wilkie was this model theorist. They had all these, um, these, these, these mathematicians and these, you know, these uh, top number theorists. And, and uh, you know, Evgeny is going through, you know, Mahler's method and doing this and that. And, you know, I'm following about, you know, <laughs> a quarter of what's going on and so on. And at some point, Evgeny is like, okay, now um, I'm going to now show this result. So this is for a weaker class entering machines, it's actually automatized. So now I'm going to explain to you what an automaton is. Now, hang on to your seat, you know, automaton definition. And then you can see, like, uh, uh, you know, like Roger Heath Brown was like, listening, you know, oh, it's got states, it's got transitions, and so on. And these guys are just not familiar with these models, and they were very attentively listening. And this guy was just basically uh, giving these very, very, uh, ba what, what to me and Ben were these very elementary definition of automata. And they were like, oh, uh, right, 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 and this, this. And, you know, and listing various basic properties of automata, uh, about regular languages and so on and so forth that you know were then used in the you know in the corresponding proof right so um, so that was that was kind of um, interesting to see these uh, these number theories sort of taking in all the 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 very tough algebraic number theory that was thrown at them at speed and then automata just was sort of uh, stomping them but uh, okay so on this story I'll I'll just stop. <laughs>